When we talk about heat and chemistry, there are two words that you need to understand. One of them is the system, and the other is the surroundings. Think about a chemical reaction that's going on in the test tube. You've got your chemicals that are mixed together, and a chemical reaction is occurring. This is the system. The surroundings are everything outside of the test tube, the air, the glass. When we think about the chemical reaction, we might draw a box to represent what's going on inside that test tube. This is the system. Everything outside, we consider the surroundings. When we talk about heat, chemists will bring up the word exothermic. The word exothermic means energy is released overall to the surroundings. So energy is being given off by the system and being absorbed by the surroundings. Think about why this makes sense. If the chemical reaction is releasing energy, that energy will be given to whatever is around it. That could be the glassware, the test tube, that could be the surrounding air. If you feel the test tube, the test tube should feel hot because energy has been released to the glass. The second word that you want to be familiar with when we talk about heat is endothermic. In an endothermic reaction, energy is absorbed from the surroundings. So if we draw a box to represent the system, and again, the surroundings are anything outside of the system, could be a test tube, could be a beaker, could be the air that's all around it. Overall, what's happening is energy in the form of heat is being absorbed from the surroundings. In other words, heat is being taken away from the air or the glass. If you were to feel the beaker or the test tube, it now should feel cold because it's been robbed of any energy that might have been removed in order for the chemical reaction to occur. When we talk about heat in chemistry, many times students will try to confuse the word temperature with heat. Temperature is a very simple concept. By definition, temperature is measuring the average kinetic energy of the molecules. In other words, how fast are they moving? If I were to take two beakers of boiling water, a small beaker and a large beaker, we know that if the water is boiling, the temperatures are both at 100 degrees Celsius. We know that the water molecules are moving at the same average speed in the small beaker and the large beaker. But do they have the same amount of heat content? Let's look at this a little bit more closely.
If I were to take a pipette and fill it with boiling water and drip that boiling water on my hand, even though it's 100 degrees Celsius, it really wouldn't hurt me. It would definitely be hot, but it wouldn't cause me any pain. Think about what would happen if I took a huge beaker of boiling water and poured it over my hand. Can you imagine the pain that that would cause? The energy that is released from the little pipette of dripping water and the energy released from the huge beaker of boiling water are not the same. They are clearly doing different amounts of work on my hand. In other words, the big beaker of boiling water is going to cause some intense damage to my hand. So that brings up an important point when we talk about heat. Heat must have something to do with how much of the substance you have. The heat that can flow from a little tiny drop of boiling water is very different than the heat that can flow from a huge beaker of water. Heat must have something to do with how much substance you have. And that variable in chemistry is called mass. Let's talk about this concept a little bit more. If we were to take a huge beaker of boiling water and pour it over my hand, it would cause extreme pain. But let's try something different. What if I were to travel to the planet Venus? Yes, I know that sounds impossible, but let's just try to visualize that for a second. When I get to the planet Venus, I encounter an alien. I guess you would call that a Venusian. I go up to the Venusian and I tell him, I'd like to try something really fun. I want to pour boiling water, a huge beaker of boiling water, on your hand. Well, the Venusian says, no problem. Go ahead and pour the huge beaker of boiling water on my hand. And what I don't realize is the Venusian has a body temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Let's think about what would happen. Boiling water, 100 degrees Celsius. The Venusian's body temperature, 100 degrees Celsius. We pour the boiling water on his hand, and what should happen? You should have some background knowledge about heat. Maybe at some point in your life you accidentally touched a hot frying pan and you realize that the heat from the hot frying pan flowed into your cold fingertips. You see, heat always flows from a hot object into a cold object. So what would happen if you put an object that's 100 degrees Celsius next to another object that's 100 degrees Celsius? Well, if they're the same temperature, then heat will not flow. If we were to try and pour 100 degrees Celsius water on the Venusian, who's 100 degrees Celsius, heat would not flow from my water into the Venusian. No damage would be done. So what information can we gain from that statement? Heat flows from hot to cold. Heat has something to do with a change in temperature. You have to have a hot object and a cold object for heat to flow. In other words, it's not related to just a temperature, it's related to a change in temperature. Heat is going to move in a certain direction. And when heat flows from a hot object to a cold object, the cold object's temperature should rise in temperature. Let's talk about one more important scenario that has to do with the concept of heat. If I were to go outside on a sunny day when the sun is shining and I took a piece of copper and next to the piece of copper I'm going to put the same exact mass of water. Let's let the piece of copper metal and the water that's in the beaker sit out in the sun for the same exact amount of time. They're both receiving the heat from the sun. They both have the same mass. 
what do you think would happen if we come back a given time later and we took the temperature of the copper and the temperature of the water? Again, you should have some background knowledge about heat. There's a reason why we use metals to create frying pans. We turn on the jet, the frying pan heats up very quickly. Metals, in general, heat up very easily. You give the sample a little bit of heat, the temperature rises very quickly. You'll also notice when the heat is turned off that the frying pan cools down very quickly. Let's compare that to making some pasta in a pot of boiling water. All that energy is coming in from the jet, but it takes forever for that water to boil. And once you turn the heat off, do you realize it takes forever for the water to cool down? There's just something about water that makes it very hard to heat up and very hard to cool down. Each substance is a little bit different. We call this concept specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is the amount of energy it takes to increase the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So in the case of copper, if we give it a little bit of energy, one gram will increase in temperature by one degree very easily. In order to get a gram of water to increase in temperature by one degree Celsius, a lot more energy has to be given to the water. So based on what we've talked about, you should realize that heat and temperature are very different things. When you take the temperature of a substance with a thermometer, it's basically telling you the average kinetic energy of those molecules. In other words, how fast are they moving? The concept of heat or thermal energy is a much larger beast to tackle. In fact, the amount of heat that's absorbed or released by a substance cannot be determined with one given instrument. You actually need to know three different variables to calculate the heat absorbed or released by a given substance. So let's talk about those three things. We mentioned that heat has something to do with how much of the substance that I have. We're going to use the variable M, which stands for mass. In other words, this is the quantity of the substance that you're working with. We also mentioned that certain substances are really easy to heat up, and other substances, they're not so easy to heat up. This concept is called specific heat capacity. We use the variable C to represent that idea. The specific heat capacity is a number that you could find in a textbook. This value will never change. And for most substances that we're familiar with, you can easily find the specific heat capacity. Finally, we said that heat always flows from a hot object into a cold object. In other words, it has something to do with a change in temperature. So our last variable we use this little triangle, which means delta, or change in temperature. And we can determine that by taking the final temperature of the object minus the initial temperature of the object. So when we calculate heat, we actually need to know three different variables. We need to know the mass of the object, the specific heat capacity of the object, and the change in temperature of the object. Let's see if we can do a couple examples of this together. 